And welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with Curtin University and the Healthy Strides Foundation. Your hosts are Dr. Dana Poole and Dr. Ashley Thornton, and together we will interview world leading researchers in the area of child health to support your practice in being more evidence based. Hi everyone, welcome to today's episode. We have a real treat today because we have a true expert in the field of vision assessment and treatments in children with neurological impairments on the show. Welcome Dr. Alison Salt. Welcome Alison. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Oh, we love that you're here, Alison. Like this is such an important topic and we've really been looking forward to discussing this paper that was actually just recently published in 2020 in Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. This article is titled Detection Vision Development in Infants and Toddlers with Congenital Vision Disorders and Profound Severe Visual Impairment. And as we said, Dr. Alison Salt is here with us, who is the lead author of this paper. And this work represents a team from Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London, all the way in the UK. Dr. Alison Salt has made significant contributions to the field uh, with over 95 publications and 3,000 citations. She's an expert in paediatric neurodisability with special expertise in childhood visual impairment and autism spectrum disorders at Great Ormond Street Hospital as well as Perth Children's Hospital. Alison and her colleagues have developed an early intervention program to support optimal development and support for parents of children with visual impairment. Alison's a wonderful teacher and with her unique skills, we know that everyone's really going to enjoy her time on the podcast with us today. Oh, I'm really, really excited about this. Look, I, I think we'll we'll hear more from Alison really soon, but I think it's really worthwhile knowing what Alison has done and the fact that she uh, travels the world is the most exciting life, I think, um, you know, apart from the fact that no one can travel at the moment, but previous <laughs> to this and soon will be as well. Um, I've actually been in London with Alison. She showed me around. We've been for dinners and we're in France for the European Academy <laughs> Conference. There's some really great memories, but importantly, Alison is actually really genuinely honest and kind and just a beautiful person. Agreed. Yeah. And Alison is also part of some really big trials here in Western Australia. So we feel very lucky to have her contributions uh, clinically and from a research perspective when she's here joining us in Perth. Yeah. <laughs> so Alison, Typically, we start our episodes with a little bit of an icebreaker. Um, so we thought that we would start today with a question about sporting events. And if you could attend any sporting event in the world, what would it be and why? Um, well, I love Wimbledon. Um, I really enjoy the tennis. Um, so I would love to go to the grand final of oh, uh, Wimbledon yep. and be in the centre court. That would be absolutely amazing. Oh, that would be amazing, I have to Pinnacle. say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. What, what about, about – oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go, I'll go. So I actually find sport very emotionally – Just it's just too much. I find it too much. I find that, you know, I'm always feeling bad for the other team but then I want someone to win. So I just find it too much. So I don't tend to follow too much sport for that mm -hmm. reason, just too much for my resources. But I do think I'd love to watch a football game at the new Camp um, in Barcelona. Ooh, I've actually yeah. been to that stadium. It seats 100,000 people. It's just out of this world. I reckon I could do that and then maybe not be hopefully too emotional at the end of yeah. it. <laughs> Sounds like you get too emotionally invested. <laughs> too invested. <laughs> it's a dangerous thing for me. <laughs> what about you, Ash? <laughs> well, I I have to admit I am with you, Alison. Centre Court Wimbledon final would be up there with my with my sporting um, <laughs> attendance, but I would also have to say I'm a huge West Coast Eagles fan, oh. and uh, which is a, an Australian rules football team for those of you who <laughs> aren't familiar. And I'd to be at the MCG for the AFL Grand Final where the Eagles were playing and winning, obviously, <laughs> would be would be a highlight for me. All right, it, it might happen this year. Are they thinking that's Maybe. the case? It happened not so long ago, so 2018 they won, so I don't know, maybe <laughs> I'm always hopeful. Always some point hopeful. soon, some yeah. point soon. Well, my nephew Joe, who's a great <laughs> Eagles fan, was actually there when the Eagles did win the final, so that was there a real Aww. pinnacle moment for him. Yeah, I'll bet. it would be. I'm very jealous. <laughs> oh, even just talking about it makes me feel really emotional. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so before Dana gets too emotional, we're going to get her to go through the, the features of the article 
for us today. <laughs> okay, I'll channel my inner zen and focus, not be too emotional. Here we go. So for the population, this study included 80 infants with bilateral congenital disorders of the peripheral visual system, which means ophthalmological disorders of the globe, the retina, anterior optic nerve to optic chiasm, and severe vision impairment to profound vision impairment. So all children had a diagnosed classifiable visual disorder and were between 8 and 16 months at baseline. Children were recruited through a national strategy with 31 NHS hospitals in the UK. Now, this is a prospective longitudinal observational study from baseline at one year of age and follow-up. 12 months later, from a nationally recruited cohort known as the Optimum Cohort. So this study set out to investigate the distribution of near detection vision as measured by the near detection scale at two time points, 12 months apart, and any change in near detection vision scores between these two time points. The study was also set out to determine the pattern of change of resolution acuity when measurable using a grating test and the association of the near detection scale, or the NDS, of the grating test scores and age. Now for the outcomes. This study reports the detection vision levels and vision development in one to two-year-olds with congenital disorders of the peripheral visual system, which is a rather heterogeneous population. This study also confirms that a standard measure of near detection vision using the NDS can be used in very young children with profound or severe vision impairment. And clinically, this is really important because it means that this measure can be used to assess current status, monitor change, and provide guidance on habilitation, such as vision promotion or adapting play material to the appropriate vision level. However, we also learned that children with profound vision impairment show less p- potential for vision change at the end of the first year of life. Thank you for that summary, Dana. Um, Alison, this study was uh, obviously part of a larger longitudinal study that looked at investigating early development and effects of early intervention on infants and young children with vision impairment. Could you tell us a bit about the larger study and how the study we're talking about today kind of fits within that context? Sure. This, um, the early study, well, this really is a sub-study of that larger study, Mm -hmm. which um, was a looking at home-based early intervention for young children with visual impairment. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, um, the idea was to collect a cohort of children, which is, they have very, this is a very rare population. Mm. And so we collected, um, we needed to recruit children from all across the UK. Um, And we were comparing the use of the developmental journal for visual impairment, which is a parent held, um, program for mm-hmm. to to use in partnership with with professionals to guide that early um obs- their, their parents observations but also to guide early intervention mm. and that was compared to um children who were receiving um just standard care and you know other approaches mm-hmm. to intervention um so that study um recruited children around 12 months followed them up at t- uh, 12 months later and then 24 months later and looking at uh, developmental outcomes. And in fact, that study did show very significant um, um, or moderate to to large effect sizes in um, improvements in language, cognition, behaviour, parental stress, Mm -hmm. and also showed improvement in uh, parent-professional relationships. So it was essentially, um, it was a pragmatic, it wasn't a randomised control Mm. trial, but it was simply observing uh, the use of this tool in the community. Mm but it did essentially show its effectiveness, um, which was very, um, you know, it was very pleasing to show that, you know, a, a home-based community-delivered intervention could improve developmental outcomes for children uh, with visual impairment who are a very vulnerable group. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that pragmatic trial is always, when you're looking at, um, I suppose, uh, clinical outcomes, mm. being able to yeah. demonstrate that pragmatically is sometimes you know as valuable if not more valuable than that really controlled randomized control format isn't it indeed Mm. and and also this is a very um a wide uh, very heterogeneous group as you've mentioned Mm, earlier of children um with a wide range of different visual impairments Mm. um but to show that you could um show improvements from that community-based intervention was was very important to show. Mm. Absolutely. And it was really representative as well. I know in note in the papers that it does represent, you know, the the population that you would expect. And I think that's, 
you know, that's really important to then know how we can translate it. That's the most exciting things when you read it and go, you can actually do these assessments in clinical practice, you know, that's been implemented, you know, it's feasible then to do it in that setting and therefore to translate that into other settings. It just makes it so much more feasible because you've thought about all the things that could be more challenging to implement. Mm. So, exactly. yeah, no, that's huge. Alison, look, I think you'll be good to, I really want to talk about the intervention and all the results from this as well. But we thought before we go too much further ahead to maybe I have a bit more of an understanding of vision development in young children, particularly with severe to profound levels of vision impairment. So I'm looking forward to this because I think I I will learn a lot from this. (laughs) So first first of all, what does typical development look like? You know, when we talk about rapid development in the first six months followed by the preschool years. So just give us a brief rundown of what that actually looks like. So young children with severe visual impairment, we're talking about their visual development, aren't yes. we? Yeah. Um, so children in that first six months, um, when you have a, an impaired um, visual system, children can often seem very visually impaired, i.e. they can seem to have no vision at all yeah. or simply perceive light Um, and in that first six months you can actually um, see quite a dramatic improvement or even through the first 12 months and it does vary a little bit according to the condition the child has so some children um, for example might have ocular albinism that's Mm -hmm. a condition that affects the retina and um, later in life these children would be able to read large print for example sure but in that first six months of life they really appear completely blind right. have no vision at all and yeah. then by six months there's a sudden suddenly they start to improve and their vision wow. really escalates quite rapidly yeah. um, many other children will show slower improvement and in and some children unfortunately there will be really very little potential to improve where there's a very se- severe uh, abnormality, for example, of the retina yep. or or when children have a very severe developmental problem of the eye where the eye really hasn't developed at mm. all. So yeah. some of those children sure. have very little potential. So there's yep. a wide range, but mm-hmm. I think it's very important for parents to know that even though their child's vision may look extremely poor, they may mm. not be looking at their parent's face, they may not be apparently responding even to light, mm. um, that that there's a great chance that that vision can improve. Yeah. Mm. And I think the, really the most important um, message about that is that what vision is so critical to learning that it's really important that we capitalise on that um, ability to for the vision to change yeah. by ensuring that we're helping the child use their vision to their best possible potential as yeah. early as possible. Yeah. So really mm-hmm. trying to drive yeah. that visual development early yeah. is really critical for early uh, childhood development. Yeah. Mm. And that's really along lines of, you know, we're talking about task-specific as well. You know, it's task-specific in, in the sense of the kind of intervention and, and thinking about what that might mean. So it, can I go back a little bit now to the difference? What pops into my head is kind of like going, well, we talk about CVI so much. CVI gets that gets termed a lot. I know mm-hmm. parents see that in the reports. CVI is quite a broad term as well. Can you just explain a little bit more of how CVI fits within what we're looking at in terms of vision impairment? Okay, so um, in respect to this particular paper, we excluded children with um, cerebral visual impairment Mm -hmm. or CVI. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people, for example, in the States call that cortical visual impairment, but we really prefer the term cerebral visual impairment. Mm -hmm. Because essentially what it means is that the vision uh, loss or impairment is due to problems with the the ability to process visual information in the uh, primary visual areas of the brain yeah. um, or the visual association areas in the brain. Sure. So it's not due to, um, as in this paper, problems with the eye yes. or the optic nerve uh, where there are sort of structural, structural. Or, or, yeah, problems. Yeah. Um, we excluded this group of children in, in this particular cohort simply because we were very interested in developmental outcomes and we wanted to exclude any... Um, additional difficulties that the child might course, have mm-hmm, and yeah. we we know that children with cerebral visual impairment um, may have suffered other uh, injuries to the brain and yep. therefore mm. their development uh, may have also been affected and so we we wanted mm. to have a much more pure sample where we were actually trying to understand the impact of vision alone yes. on development mm-hmm. yes yeah. yeah and that makes sense yeah so um 
Could you explain to us how you differentiate between children with profound vision impairment and severe vision impairment? Mm -hmm. So um, this is a these are terms that we use particularly in in um, our group, our, mm. our developmental research group and clinical group, mm -hmm. um, because we have found that um, profound visual impairment is is highly is a high predictor of um, developmental outcome. Mm. Mm. A profound visual impairment um, is defined by our team as children who have um, either no vision at all mm -hmm. or just light perception. Right. So they don't have the ability to recognise any form or object. Um, so, And that group of children have a, um, a very high risk of, of developmental out, poor developmental outcomes. Mm. About 30% of these children will have very severe um, um, developmental difficulties um, and and some go on to develop autism spectrum disorder. So we know that that's a group that's highly vulnerable. Mm. And therefore, we really want to, especially in that group, as we talked about how vision can change mm. significantly in those first six months to 12 months of life, we really want to make sure that those children very early on get the advantage of as much vision as possible. So if we can shift them from just light perception into having form vision, that really makes a big impact on children's learning mm -hmm. and their ability to understand their world. Wow, yep, for sure. And I suppose that kind of leads us nicely into the, the next question I had, which was around assessing vision and, and vision assessments and where things currently stand um, and what kinds of assessments are currently being done. So, you know, if we're talking about a functional vision battery, what does that kind of look like? Okay, so... Um Assessing vision, I mean, vision is a really complex ta uh, task that mm -hmm. includes can, a whole yeah. range of um, <laughs> yeah. different um, parts to it. I mean, first of all, you need to understand the the eye itself. Mm -hmm. You know, does that look healthy? Yeah. Um, and an ophthalmologist would be able to look at the eye and check that there aren't any structural abnormalities. They can check that um, the eye is... Um, uh, focusing yeah. light on the right part of the retina and that's what we call refraction or yeah. some people also you know does the child need glasses essentially yeah. Yeah. Um, we want to look whether the children the children can move their eyes smoothly and whether they can move their eyes quickly mm -hmm. between objects um, do their eyes move in parallel mm -hmm. so looking for something like a squint or mm -hmm. sort of problem yeah um, and then we want to see how well can a child see and there's a most um, vision assessments tend to relate to acuity, which mm -hmm. is, I guess, what we're all kind of used to doing, which is going along to the optician and, and looking at whether you can read the letters on a chart. Yep. And clearly in babies and young children, that's not a possible no. measure. <laughs> so there are different ways of looking at acuity, which means um, your ability to um, see detail. Mm -hmm. um, or the, I think the correct definition is to see the difference between two points. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, acuity can be measured by um, in young infants often by a technique called preferential looking. So you have um, a card that has black and white stripes on one side and a grey circle or square on the other side and babies will automatically look towards the most uh, prominent um, uh, stimulus in the environment. Mm -hmm. So they will automatically preferentially look towards the stripe targets. Mm -hmm. And then the stripes get smaller and smaller and smaller until the child no longer shows that looking behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's what we refer to in the paper as grating acuity. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. it's really measured um, essentially by, um, this is quite, you have to be quite good at physics, which I'm definitely not <laughs> in, in understanding this definition, but um, it's essentially seeing how many black and white stripes can be seen subtended in one degree on the retina. Okay. So the smaller and smaller and smaller the stripes you can still see, mm. the better your visual acuity. Mm. So that's a useful way of measuring vision. Wow. But um, we do find that this is not always possible in children with the very lowest levels of vision. So um, really because they can't even see, they can't see even the biggest black and white stripes. Right. Or it could be that the child has a very narrow visual field. So when you hold the two stripes up, they may not even see that there is another stripe target right. sure. in front yeah. of them. Yeah. Or sometimes in our toddlers in particular, just behaviorally, they're just not interested in, <laughs> in, in playing the game. So yeah. Yeah. it's... In babies, generally, that they're they're much more likely mm. to do this automatically. But yeah. 
um, in toddlers, you can easily get the no, can do, not going no. to get involved with this a uh, game uh, yeah. response. You've got compliance. You yes, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. So the thing that's, I think, quite neglected in terms of systematic um assessment is this uh, what we've called near detection vision which is what yeah. we've talked about in the paper yeah and detection vision is simply that you can recognize you can see that something is there mm. you know you may not necessarily have the ability to get the detail from it mm-hmm. but you you can fit you can look at something and you say well there is something there on yeah. the table yeah. I don't know what it is yeah but um, that's something that I can look at mm. so our near detection scale, was designed to try to systematically look at a, a child's ability to detect. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has a very systematically um, uh, changing uh, size of lure that um, that attracts to attract the child's attention mm. to it. So it starts with um, either a, a no response to light mm-hmm. or response to light reflecting objects or does the child fix on a larger object that is just um, coloured? Usually mm-hmm. we use black and yellow. And then the objects get smaller and smaller. And in the very um, highest end of the scale, children are looking at very small objects on a tabletop down to a one millimeter sized object. Right. And that gives you the ability to, and, and this is uh, in our study, we found that 100% of children can do this test. Mm. Whereas the, um, the acuity measure, the great teen acuity measure, we found that only 35% of our children because of their very severe and low level of vision, could not mm. they couldn't do the acuity test. Yeah. But we were able to get a measure for the whole population, which means that you can say something about the child's ability to see. Yeah. And having that information, it really helps um, us to be able to then guide um, advice about you know the size of object that a child can see mm. and therefore being able to advise about the toy, the toys that the child might be able to be used for their... So it can really both, guide their intervention. Yeah, guides, yeah. absolutely okay. guides yep. their intervention. Yeah. Yeah. And and for families as well, like I imagine it it would be quite disheartening to, to a family to hear that, you know, there's or we weren't able to get you know, a, an outcome on this assessment for yeah. your child, whereas, you know, this, the near detection scale to be able to at least have something to to move forward with, I imagine that is quite powerful for families yes, as well. Yes, absolutely. Mm. We often mm. find families come away from the eye clinic, for example, um, saying, well, they said they can't really tell and we'll just have to wait until yeah. we, we can say something about that. Mm-hmm. And um, that, I think, you know, isn't clearly not true and it, it it also is very real for families. So mm. they see their child mm. fixing and looking at an object um, and see the size that they can see. You mm. know, it gives them some hope and yeah. understanding and um, it sort of demystifies as well. It, does, yeah. it doesn't have to be a very fancy test with numbers that nobody can really understand, <laughs> um, you know, that and it, it is very important then to guide. I like how concrete it is in that sense yeah, as well and definitely. that – you can see the translation almost in terms of grading, that so there's just different mm-hmm. levels that you can take from that yeah. too. Like I can see why it would be such a great assessment to use. And question about the assessment, how long would you expect to be able to tell a child can see something, even though it's, you know, d- different kinds of sizes, how long would you expect them to fixate or to, to pay attention to it? What's your sort of guide on that? Um, I think don't think there's really a time but sure. you can just see from the quality of the child's sure. gaze mm-hmm. okay yeah. that that they are really they've really alerted and okay. fixed on that on that object yeah okay. it's it's a it's a kind of human quality it's quite hard to yeah. give that yeah. a you know an actual number but yeah. you you know when a child really is looking at something you can mm. tell yeah yeah so on that then who can do this assessment it's really um absolutely anyone Right. I'd say, okay. you know, mm-hmm. um, I mean, even parents yeah. can give you a very good um, understanding of what they feel a child can see. Mm. But therapists, you know, there is no wow. special training for this. It's yep. a simple, very simple tool. Yep. You're simply looking for fixation. Yeah. And it's very clear when a child can Great. fix on a, on one of these objects yeah. and uh, when they can't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's a kit that they can buy or like how, how do they get the tools, you I guess? You can literally make it up yourself. Right. Okay. So very easy. 
So oh, that oh, sounds fantastic. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Wait for Christmas time, make up a tinsel ball for yep. your light reflecting object. You can yep. have a mirror for light reflecting as yep. well. Um, probably the, the 12 centimeter ball is, you know, you have to look around, find mm-hmm. a black and yellow football perhaps. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. These tend to be dangling on a black string because you don't want the child interested in your hand or sure. things so that it, your hand is out of the way. Yep. Um, and then on a tabletop, have a contrasting background and the to- and the things that you're getting the child to look at are a yellow cube right. of 2.5 centimetres, yep. a yellow Smarty. Yep. Which is, I think everyone knows what a Smarty is. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Know. <laughs> Perhaps an M&M. I think m and is slightly smaller, smaller but yeah. m and M. Yep. Um, they're little sweeteners that you can get in in the UK. They're called Hermosita and Saccharin, but here you have quite similar sized, five millimetres, three millimetres. Mm-hmm. And they're really good because if the child is fast and puts them in their mouth, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. So yes, you don't yes. want anyone. And then the smallest is just a um, 100,000, you know, a sprinkle yes. cake decoration. Wow. Mm-hmm. So wow. essentially okay. these are go out and buy them yourself. And that make is a amazing. Gift. That is so good. And the other thing that's really helpful about this is that you can actually monitor vision over time in these yes. children with very low vision. Yes. So you can see the changes yep. and that can also update your guidance. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love so it. So easily accessible <laughs> and, yeah. Available. Which is so unique, isn't yeah. it, in this yeah. area? It's so unique. Definitely. Well, I think this is a good segue into the results now because I want to know what the results are. Hey? Yeah, yeah. So for, so for this particular study, Alison, what, what were your main findings? Okay, so in this um, part of the cohort, we were able to look at vision changes from the 12-month recruitment time up to then and 12 months later. Mm-hmm. And we showed that... Um, children's vision, um, if they had uh, severe visual impairment but not profound visual impairment, these children continued to show improvement along the near detection scale um, at the two-year mark Mm -hmm. so that vision had continued to improve in that second year of life. Mm -hmm. Um, We also found that um, vision, the vision, the um, great inacuity cards were broadly correlated with the near detection scale. Mm -hmm. Clearly they're different kinds of vision so we didn't expect them to be have any sort of exact correlation, sure. but they did clearly show that as acuity improved, also the near detection scale improved. Um, we also found that um, there was a much wider spread across the near detection scale, mm-hmm. but by the end of the second year of life, children were much more um, up towards the, the ceiling level, I guess, of the because um, being able to see a one millimeter object, which is the top level, mm-hmm. you could still have quite poor vision and mm. still be able to detect a very small hermesy, uh, small um, 100,000. <laughs> um, that's a one millimetre object. Um, but those children were, for those children who were also able to do the acuity cards, we saw that their vision also improved. So if you were at the ceiling of the chest, for example, at the beginning, mm. at the 12-month mark, um, at the second year, if you were able to do the acuity test, we saw continuing to improve it. Vision, mm. so essentially, we showed that vision can improve in children with severe visual impairment over that um, second year of life. Mm. Unfortunately, we found that children with profound visual impairment at that twelve-month mark yep. did not show any further improvement. Okay. So, really, I think suggesting that you know, some of these children perhaps had no potential to improve mm. anyway mm-hmm. because of their eye condition. Sure, um, but um, I think. One feels that you, if you have profound visual impairment in that first year of life, you really need to get in early to try and um, see if you can improve vision during that first year yeah. because by the second year there's not likely to be any improvement. Mm. So that early detection becomes really significant then. Yeah, mm. very important. Mm-hmm. And it really allows you to give parents advice and really reassurance that in that second year, even if the child's vision is still quite poor Mm. by 12 months, you might still hope for better improvement in children with severe visual impairment. And you can also explain to parents that perhaps you're not going to be expecting any further improvement in that second year, which clearly is going to be a hard thing to hear. But I think at least, you know, sometimes parents... Uh, value certainty um, yeah. and, and a real understanding of, of what is possible. Yeah. Um, and then they can move on with um, how to guide their child plans. in their learning from yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, that came up in our podcast with Rachel Byrne, wasn't it? Parents want to know the results to uh, the assessments they're done for their child, what it means for them so that they can look at what interventions there might be. Mm-hmm. 
And I, I think this just highlights the importance of early intervention. We talk about that, but here it's it's really significant. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I guess maybe from here is, you know, what what can therapists do? What can clinicians do when they when they do an assessment? I think that's probably the first part is to really jump on to doing assessments yeah. early on. To now know. that we know that, you know, those tools are probably quite readily available to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What would what would your advice be there? Um, I think um, absolutely what you said, that observation and assessment is absolutely key. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's sort of a step that's missed out. Yeah. Mm. And if you don't fully understand the child's level of vision, it's very hard to just provide generic advice. Mm, that's right. So it really needs to be based on what do you know that child can see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, for example, if a child is, is really just responding to light reflection on a um, uh, on a toy but not to any toys that don't have light or light reflecting mm. um, you need you would be thinking about well, how do I help this child to learn more about mm. what they see yeah. because um, the thing about vision is it's not just what uh, messages are coming into the back of the eye it's really what the brain then makes of those mm. and how do you understand what you're seeing so cognitive interest is really important yeah. mm-hmm. So helping a child to not just be able to you have some idea that something is there, mm. but to understand more about what it is. Sure. So introducing a multisensory approach is really critical. Mm-hmm. So using touch to feel while mm-hmm. they're looking is mm-hmm. really important. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes sound as well to sort of really motivate to to look. So that multisensory approach is really important. And many people, I think, think about visual stimulation as just providing lots of visual information. Yeah. Mm. But I think if that's not linked to cognitive interest and understanding, then it's not really as effective in, ter- in terms of really promoting visual development. Mm. Oh, that's such a great point, isn't yeah. it? You can already see how, as a clinician now, I'm just thinking of the kind of toys that you'd present. You know, they're not just the toy selection. There's so much science behind toy collection um, and, and what it is that you present to a child. Absolutely. Development. You're not just talking about motor. You're talking about cognitive development, mm-hmm. exploration. Mm-hmm. It's kind of part of the environmental enrichment, isn't it? You're mm-hmm. just thinking about yeah. the big picture that can have really profound long-term outcomes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're thinking, I always try to break this into two different parts. One is there's you're trying to help a child see the best they possibly can. Yes. So you're starting with what they're just aware, aware of, yep. helping them to really fix on that, maintain their visual attention, yep. and then perhaps to try to learn to move and track smoothly those objects. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and then the second part is how do you use that visual information that you're getting to help your learning. Mm. So, for example, if you're trying to teach a child about where sounds are around them, because children don't know that automatically when they're visually impaired. Mm -hmm. So you might use a rattle uh, if the child has only an an awareness of light reflecting toys. Mm. You might wrap that rattle up in alfoil or something that reflects light or has mirrors so that when the child hears a sound, they might also also then catch a glimpse of it and that really reinforces their understanding of visual awareness. Or you might be trying to teach them about sitting and sitting balance. You might want to think about what's the floor like because they may have no awareness of Mm, the floor around them if they don't see it. So you might be thinking this child can see black and white, so perhaps I should make that floor black and white or Mm. perhaps I should make it light reflecting or think about the lighting in the environment. Mm. So your, your vision assessment will really be guiding your developmental program yeah. and, and guiding what toys you use and what mm-hmm. environment you set things up in. Yeah. And do you find as children get older, so, you know, intervention for children over, say, 12 months of age, do you find that, that the cognitive interest part of what you're talking about comes into play even more? You know, it's it's quite hard to get children to attend to things that they aren't necessarily interested in do you have to kind of change your tactics a little bit as they get older I think it's same tactics it's Mm. really just thinking what can they see Mm. you know there's no point in introducing a child to a book with lots of small faded pale pink you know (laughs) um, non-contrasting pictures you might want to you know if you know that a child can see strong bold contrasting colors then you want to introduce a book that's really got those mm. features to it yeah. that that you know make those things recognizable because of their out, outline their contour 
um, and the contrast of the background behind it. Oh, love so, all the thought behind that. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think the take-home message really is, you know, using your assessment to in to make sure that the environment you're providing for the child is is really setting them up for those learning opportunities. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think that leads us really nicely into my, I suppose, final question to you, Alison. Um, based on everything that you know and have learnt throughout this process, what would be your recommendation for future work or where would you like to see this this work go in the future? Well, I, I really would like to see... Um, some better evidence. Um, the the randomised control trial completed by Dr. Songson has never been re, um, repeated. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I'd really like to look more um, systematically mm-hmm. at that early development of vision in those early days, um, in the early months of life, um, and to look at um, again at that visual promotion. So there's really really good evidence out there that we know exactly how we can do this best and mm. get the best possible vision for our children. Um, and also, of course, these are challenge, challenging things to do because research funding is hard to find and yes. it's um, they're very rare populations of children. Mm, yeah. um, but I think we need a lot more so research important. in that in that yeah. area. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh, Agreed. that was so good. Alison, I think my brain is tingling because it's, um, <laughs> it's learned so much new stuff. So, look, I think this is going to be a great way to now head into the next segment, which is Tell it to Ed. Now, this segment is all about the 60-second pitch to the common man, Ed. And as you keep on hearing, this is, yes, the most popular part of the entire show. (laughs) And he's very proud of himself. If only you could see the smirk on his face. (laughs) (laughs) So this provides a great opportunity to describe this research to someone who doesn't have a background in child health. So, Alison, take it away. Okay, I hope I can do this well for you, Ed. (laughs) It's a challenge. So children born um, with low vision can continue to show improvement in their vision even into the second year of life. Vision can be measured um, using very simple but systematic observations of what a child can see. But if by 12 months of age, child still um, has no vision or is just aware of light, vision is unlikely to improve um, after 12 months. Oh, great summary. Wow. Very good summary. Fantastic. That was good. All right, Ed, any questions? Uh, I keep saying this every week. I have lots of questions. <laughs> um, Only this time was, for um, one. <laughs> this was quite insightful. Um, obviously, like I, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a researcher, I don't r- really think of things in this way. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's quite en- enlightening without trying to use a pun there. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry about that. Ba, 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 ba. Wait, ba. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll edit this out and we'll never know. <laughs> um, so I guess um, my question is over um, uh, those things that, that are called, what, s- sensory rooms? Um, where there's like lots of light and bubbles and things and sensor experiences. Um, I guess my question is, is, is there a real real purpose to that? Like does it, does it help to promote vision or, or sight? I think, um, I think it needs to be thought about very carefully. So, um, again, there's not very much evidence in this field, yeah. sadly. Yeah. Um, the f- the only randomised control trial done on visual promotion was done by Patricia Songson in uh, back in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. And she showed that the kind of approach that I talked about with that multisensory um, mm-hmm. engagement based on, ob- based on assessment um, did show more rapid improvement in children's vision. But there aren't any uh, really well done trials about mm. visual stimulation on its yeah. own, i.e. just disembodied yeah. visual information yeah. in a room. Yeah. And my hunch, um, because it seems to make sense to me, is that I don't think that does a great deal mm. to really stimulate or promote vision. Yeah, yeah. Because I think it really has to be about cognitive interest. So yeah. those um, sensory rooms are great in the sense that they provide for a child that can only see light. They provide a nice dark environment where you could introduce light producing mm-hmm. toys yeah. that they could learn from. But I really think you need to engage yeah. with um, touch, yeah. sound and motivation it's and that extra cognitive, step. It's, that cognitive yeah. interest yeah. in what is going on yeah. as opposed to simply having visual information sure. around the room, which means nothing to the child. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, Alison, thank you so much for being on the show, teaching us so much with great takeaways already. And I really do mean that. And for everyone who's been listening, hope you enjoyed it as well. Remember, the run sheet notes are also on the website, so researchworks.net. And like many of you, um, if you want this recorded as part of your CPD requirements, the form you can fill out on the website as well. We'll help you keep a record of that too. Yes. Thank you so much again, Alison. I certainly learned a lot today and really appreciate the time that you took to to teach us. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's been really fun. Oh, Thanks. good. Yeah. All right. Well, Wonderful. we'll say goodbye and we'll talk to you guys all again next time. Bye. 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 Bye.